Hi guys, it's Claire. Welcome back. Today I am back at you with the second half of my April reading wrap up here to talk about the best books that I read this month. And I do want to say I'm really sorry for the terrible audio quality on my last video. I think that the microphone on my phone is broken, which is kind of a bummer, but I'm filming this on an older phone. So I think the video quality might be worse, but hopefully you'll be able to hear me better. But anyway, let's get into the books. I want to kick things off by talking about Meaty by Samantha Irby, which is a collection of essays that are as hilarious as they are real and relatable. And I read Samantha Irby's other essay collection, We Are Never Meeting in Real Life, last summer, and I really enjoyed it. The two books share a really similar tone and sense of humor, but this one is a little bit more about her life as a 30-something single woman living living in Chicago and just trying to get by. And I just find Samantha Irby's sense of humor really hysterical. She has a really sarcastic and deadpan tone, and she infuses all of her essays with just a feeling of being kind of exasperated and like done with the world. And I really admire the way that she's able to talk about serious subject matter in a really funny way, whether she's talking about growing up with a sick parent or working a dead-end job. And I mentioned this when I talked about We Are Never Meeting in Real Life, but a lot of her writing reminds me of the Carrie Fisher quote, if my life wasn't funny, then it would just be true, and that is unacceptable. I also really recommend listening to this book on audiobook because Samantha Irby narrates it herself, and she does an excellent job and has great comic timing and delivery, and it's just a delight to listen to, and I found myself laughing out loud like several times, which by my standards is a huge success. Next up, I want to quick mention I'll Be Right There by Kyung Suk Shin, and I made a full video discussing my thoughts about this book, which I thought was structurally flawed in a lot of ways, but still emotionally powerful. And this book follows a group of university students living through the tumultuous 1980s in South Korea, which was a period marked by political unrest, public demonstrations, and a lot of ominous deaths and disappearances. And this is a deeply sad book filled with a lot of loss and unthinkable tragedy, to the point that the narrative starts to feel a little bit emotionally manipulative, but it also has a strong strain of nostalgia running through it, and it has a sense of looking backward on one's youth and the radiance of that period of life and the depth of the friendships that you have when you're young and kind of the sweetness of first love. And because of that, I found this book really moving despite all of my problems with it. And Kyung Suk Shin has talked about how one of her goals with this book was to illustrate the ways in which we might be, quote, the protagonists of tragedy, but how we are also the heroes of our most beautiful and thrilling moments, which I think is a really perfect way to describe this book. And even though I ultimately had mixed feelings about it, I do recommend it with reservations, and I'll link my full video down below if you want to hear more of my thoughts on this one. This month I also read Snow Country by Yasunari Kawabata, and in contrast to I'll Be Right There, this was a book that I really admired and appreciated on a sort of formal and stylistic and, I suppose, intellectual level, while at the same time having almost no emotional reaction to any part of the story or the characters in this book. The story follows a wealthy but kind of aimless man from Tokyo named Shimamura who has retreated to a remote hot spring town in the mountains for a portion of the winter where he has developed a sort of relationship with one of the hot spring geishas there. And I would say this is a pretty cold and stark book and not just because it's set amidst the chill and the deep drifts of Japan's snow country. It's emotionally cold because Shimamura is a person who is in search of aesthetic experiences but who has no interest in engaging with the reality of the beauty that he seeks. He exists in kind of this unreal world made up of aesthetic impressions and visual images that to him become kind of merely symbolic. And what I mean by that is that he spends a lot of time with this geisha, who for her part is kind of in love with him, 
but what he loves most about her and finds most thrilling about her is the way that she has a kind of sadness and wasted beauty about her and how that sense of wasted beauty suggests profundity and poetry to him. And the story itself has a very fragmented feel to it. It often feels as if scenes are out of sequence or there will be these kind of abrupt transitions and interruptions, but I think it kind of parallels the way in which Shimamura experiences life as these fragments of beauty and aesthetic experiences instead of seeking out something more solid and coherent and meaningful. So although I had trouble engaging with this book on an emotional level, I found it pretty interesting to contemplate this character who is so intent on finding meaning through an intellectual or aesthetic experience, and because of that he kind of experiences life from a distance almost as if he's separated from everything by a pane of glass. I also think it's pretty interesting to consider the ways in which his aesthetic satisfaction often comes at the very real cost of the two female characters in the book, but that's a paper that somebody else can write. And last but certainly not least, I want to talk about Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese. And I first saw this book a while ago on Alex from Big Al Books' channel. And Richard Wagamese, who sadly passed away last year, is a fairly prominent First Nations writer in Canada. And from what I understand, this book was quite popular when it was released there a few years ago. And this edition was just released in the U.S. by Milkweed Editions last month. And this book follows a young boy named Saul Indian Horse, who is a member of the Ojibwe people living in northern Ontario when he he is taken by the authorities and sent to one of the infamous residential schools that operated in Canada for over 100 years, and it is at St. Jerome's that Saul faces the unthinkable cruelties and abuse that so characterized these residential schools, where children were separated from their families and their communities, where they were stripped of their languages and cultures, and where many children ultimately died because of the horrible mistreatment that they faced. And it's only when Saul discovers the sport of hockey and realizes that he has a sort of unnatural gift for that sport that he gains a ticket out of the residential school system and goes to live with an Ojibwe family and play on a reservation team. And this is a slim but tightly told story that traces Saul's upward trajectory from sort of backyard pond hockey to the reservation circuit and then on to the junior leagues where he finds himself playing with and against mostly white players in front of mostly white crowds that become increasingly unwelcoming and hostile. And it's in this environment that the game, which for Saul was initially a sort of freedom and escape from his circumstances, becomes a constant reminder of how he is other and how he is not welcome. And I'm not Canadian, but as someone whose parents are from Minnesota and who grew up watching a ton of hockey, I have to say that the descriptions of hockey in this book are so thrilling and so evocative. And as I was reading, I could hear the sound of skates scraping on the ice and the sound of bodies being knocked into the boards. And these aren't just mere great sports descriptions. Richard Wagamese is able to capture the rhythm and the momentum and the grace of the game in a way that helps you understand how hockey kind of lifts Saul up and carries him away with it and kind of delivers him from his painful past. And in addition to the beautiful descriptions of hockey, Richard Wagamese also incorporates a lot of beautiful descriptions of the land and of Saul's relationship with trees and lakes and the land of his people. And even when he's taken away from that land, you still get a sense of his emotional attachment to landscapes, which I thought was really powerful because I would say a lot of this book is about Saul trying to form and hold on to a sense of place and a sense of identity in a world that is constantly trying to strip him of it. And this is a devastating read and not an easy book by any means, but it does come full circle in some really beautiful ways, in ways that sometimes feel a little bit too neat and tidy, 
but it also doesn't negate all of the horrible things that Saul has been made to endure. And so in that way, Richard Wagamese is able to tell this really beautiful and powerful story that is still unflinching and uncompromising in its depiction of the ways in which Native people have been mistreated by Canada and how much has been lost because of that mistreatment and those historical injustices. So those were the best books that I read in the month of April. If you have any thoughts on them, definitely let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, I'll see you next time and thanks so much for watching, guys. Bye!